All right, reading out of the book of Psalms, chapter, uh, I think I said 45, but it's Psalms 145, so keep turning, and verse 18. <clears throat> the Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. You know, how much joy do you find when you pray? Or do you even think about finding joy in prayer? Maybe you've never even thought about that before. But, you know, as a nation... We are, we, the people are constantly searching for joy, for pleasure, for happiness. On average, according to one study, an American spends $1,399 on entertainment. Now, if you're between the ages of 35 and 54, that goes up to $1,610. The average American spends $297, almost $300 a month, to be entertained. One study said the average American spends approximately 30% um, of their monthly income on entertainment. <clears throat> Recreation expenditures include membership for clubs, parks, theaters, sports centers, gambling, and other related services. And over the last five years, going up through mid-2024, America has spent $624.4 billion seeking pleasure on being entertained. Why do we want to be, be entertained? Why do we want to be happy? Well, we, you know, it, it's amazing how we always tend to believe that the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, I, I had a picture one time of a cow, and I can't find it. I don't know what I did with it, and I searched to try to find it again. But the cow was standing on a woven, beside a woven wire fence. And he had his head, body on one side, his head went through the fence, and then went back through the fence. So he was eating on the same side where he was standing, but his neck was stretched through the woven wire fence. And that's the way we are. We always think we're going to find joy somewhere else, and when we get there, it's always on the other side. It's somewhere else other than where we're at. We are so easily bored in life, we're always searching for something new. No matter what we have, we want something more. We want something different. It, we're never satisfied with what we have. But do we think about finding joy, spending time with God? Probably don't think about that. When life is good, it's easy to be happy. But the problem is, Life is not always good. Life happens. And when things happen, when things don't go our way, when problems and troubles arise, does it steal our joy? It should. Our joy shouldn't depend upon our situation in life. Amen. Anytime we become discouraged, we're ready to throw in the towel, we're ready to give up, we're ready to quit. <clears throat> I thought about Abraham. Remember the story of Abraham. Lot ends up down in uh, uh, Sodom. Things are not going well down there. Uh, the city is kind of like America today. <clears throat> it's in shambles. Everything is going against the will of God. And God decides that He's going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Abraham's a little upset because his nephew is down there. And so he goes down to God and he begins to plead with God. God and he says, God, we, we, are you going to destroy the whole city? What if I can go down there and find 50 righteous people? God said, okay. 
If you can go down, God knows all things. He knows he's not going to find 50. He says, if you can find 50 righteous people, I'll spare the city. Now maybe Abraham thought, God gave in too easy. Maybe we better try again. What if I'm five short? Okay. If you can find 45 people. Maybe Abraham said again, that's too easy. What about 40, God? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And each time God said, okay, if you can find that many righteous people, I'll spare the city. And I don't know if finally if God, at, the, at that point, God said, okay, Abraham, enough's enough. But Abraham didn't get discouraged. He kept going. He kept bargaining with God. Because he, he didn't want his nephew to lose his life. He wanted his nephew and his family to be safe. So, so he continued going on the fight. <clears throat> the Bible said, And the Lord went His way as soon as He had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. He was content to go back home. He was happy because he had had his conversation with God and he believed that the city was going to be spared if God could find these righteous people, even down to ten, because we know that God wasn't able to find uh, that many people uh, in there. Life's not always good, and sometimes it doesn't go our way. But Abraham, he was concerned about his nephew, and he knew that he had done his part in preserving his nephew's life. The story of Abraham <clears throat> when he, as he talked to God. It should give us hope in our life. Because if Abraham would receive this answer from God, if God would deal and bargain with Abraham in a method such as this, would He not also deal with us in the same way? The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. The book dictionary <clears throat> says hope is a feeling of expectation, a desire, or a wish for a certain thing to happen. In the Bible, in the Greek or the Hebrew language, depending on which, one, which scripture you're looking at, it says hope is an expectation with certainty that God will do what He has said. God will do what He has said. The problem in life is this. We have a tendency to bring God down to our level. What happens? We, we really don't believe God will do what He said He'll do. Why? Well, because man lies. Man makes mistakes. Man doesn't always follow through. Man fails. He forgets. He disappoints. He doesn't always fulfill His promises. And because we have brought God down to our level, we think the same thing's going to happen to, towards us with God. How many times in life, because we attempt to place God on our own level, is it that we don't believe God will answer our prayer? We go to God in prayer, we take our prayer request to God, but we don't really believe that God will answer the prayers. Because again, we place God on our level instead of realizing that God is not on our level. He doesn't think like we think, He doesn't act like we act. God cannot lie. God will not disappoint. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6 said, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor to our soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner who entered before us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God who cannot lie. When God gives us a promise, it's a promise that will be fulfilled. Knowing that we can enter His presence should bring joy into our lives. James said in James chapter 5, He says, Is there any among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone sick? Let him let him go, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Is anybody suffering among you? Now that could be a physical suffering, a mental suffering, any type of suffering at all. Is anybody suffering? He said, let him pray. Talk about praying for the sick. The word sick in the Greek language in that scripture literally means faint, weary, to toil. It means to exert strength with pain and fatigue of body or mind, particularly of the body, with effects of some continuation or duration. To endure something for a long period of time. Are we enduring hardships in our life? The Bible says pray. Is what James tells us. When these things happen, pray. We talked about this recently. When we take time to enter into God's presence. Remember, we talked about this. When, when, when Jesus died on the cross. And the veil of the temple was ripped in two. The separation between man and God was put to an end. And you and I have the privilege, the honor of entering directly into God's presence. Amen. To stand directly before God. And there is joy in the presence of the Lord. We should find that joy in our lives. Uh, studies, numerous studies have been done in the medical profession uh, of dealing with people who are sick. And people having people praying for them. And, and it's been proven that people of faith heal faster than people who claim to have no faith whatsoever. People who have people praying for them recover quicker and better than people who have no faith at all. Who claim no religious uh, affiliations with any group. Why we need to be praying one for another. Man often carries a heavy load that's unnecessary to carry and that's detrimental to our health. Uh, I, I remember, I don't know how many of you watched uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. But there was a show one time where Walker was going to go into the Badlands and uh, he, he did this for a renewal and refreshing. And his partner, James Trevette, wanted to go along with him. So he, he finally, you know, convinced Walker to let him go. And so when Walker pulls up that morning to go, Trevette's got this whole pile of stuff, uh, a tent and a knapsack and, and all kinds of things, cooking utensils and everything. Walker has nothing. And he tells Trevette, he said, when we go to the Badlands, we go for renewal. We don't carry all that stuff with us. You don't need to take all that's left behind. Well, Trevette was kind of disappointed and in the show. He actually got a phone call that said he had to appear in court that week. And so he couldn't go. And he was he acted like he was disappointed, but he was relieved. Because he wanted to carry all his baggage with him. But Walker knew that when you go for renewal, you don't carry the baggage with you. You leave it behind. You go alone. And that's what we have to do in life. We have to learn... To, as the scripture says, cast all our cares uh, on, on the Lord. The Amplified Bible, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Amplified or have a copy of it, <clears throat> but what the Amplified Bible does, it takes the scripture and it adds other words to the scripture based on the Greek or the Hebrew language because when you look up, just like you look up in one of our English dictionaries, you look up the definition of a word, and sometimes there's more than one definition. So what the Amplified Bible does, it takes some of the other words that could have been used in the translation and adds them into the Scripture. That Scripture out of 1 Peter 5 and 7 in the Amplified Bible says this, Cast the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, all of your worries, all of your concerns, once and for all, on Him, for He cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. 
God cares about you more than you can ever imagine. And He wants you to cast your all upon Him. Not part of it, not some of it. Psalms 55.22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He shall sustain you, and He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Do we cast everything upon Him? In Psalms 55.22 in an earlier verse, he said, verse 16, he said, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and He shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that is against me, for there are many that are against me. David said, I will call, and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, noon. Throughout the day, I can call upon the Lord. You know, there's no set time that we have to pray. You know, I've got to get up at 5 a.m. and pray because that's the only time God's available. God's available all day long. Amen. And we have the privilege of going to Him in prayer. And it said, I will pray and He will hear my voice. Yeah. You know, we seem like in life we find more joy in winning than in losing. We talk about being a good loser, uh, but we all like to win. Matter of fact, Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach of the Green Bay Packers, said, Show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. Uh, he was also quoted as saying, Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, but later he said he was misquoted or he misspoke. And he said what he meant to say was, Winning is not everything, the will to win is the only thing. And we should always have that will to win, that desire to win. Uh, sometimes we say we're just playing for fun, and that's usually when we're losing. <laughs> we should have that desire to win, though. And <clears throat> to be victorious <clears throat> in life, that is the privilege that God has given each one of us. Because we are going to be victorious in this life. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, <clears throat> said the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. To think that God hears our prayers. Not only does he hear our prayers, but he answers our prayers. Matter of fact, David was praying. And, and he said... I cried to the Lord with my voice, and He heard, from, heard me from His holy hill. That's out of Psalms chapter 3. Psalms chapter 3 was written by David. And it was written at a time when one of his sons, Absalom, was trying to overthrow David and become the king himself. And, and David began the Psalms somewhat overwhelmed. He was near panic because of the numbers of the enemy that were around him. He talked about 10,000 uh, men gathering around him. But if you read through Psalms chapter 3, you, you can kind of notice in the reading, David's mood changed. He, he starts off overwhelmed, worried, concerned, because 10,000 men were gathering up around him and his own son was trying to kill him. But then as he began to talk to God, he began to realize, I'm talking to God. I'm crying out to God and out of His holy hill, He hears me. And when he kind of realizes that God is listening to him, his mood begins to change. And he closes out the psalm by saying, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Amen. God's blessing is upon us when we cry out to Him. And when we cry out to Him, God is always Listening. James, back in James chapter 15, 5, verse 16, we were reading earlier. He said, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> Confess your trespasses one to another. Uh, a man once said, now, what he's talking about, he's not talking about confessing our sins to each other. You've got to be very careful about that. 
probably told the story before, three fish, three preachers out in the boat fishing. One of them says, you know, preachers have it hard. Uh, everybody comes and tells us their problems and their troubles, and we don't have anybody we can talk to. So while we're out here fishing, I thought it might be a good idea if we talk to each other. Maybe if we got a weakness, a problem, something we need prayer about, we can share it with each other. And uh, so the other two preachers agree. But they noticed one of the preachers seemed a little bit nervous about it. So the preacher that brought up the idea said, well, I'll go first. He said, um, I have a little problem every once in a while. I get a little nervous. And he said, uh, I take a little drink before I go to the pulpit. And he said, I know I shouldn't do that. It's not right. But it just seems like it helps me relax. And I, I've been doing it. He said, I want you all to pray for me that I, I can get over that and not do that anymore. Well, I noticed this one preacher just seemed a little bit more nervous than, than before. And he just kept kind of wringing his hands and being nervous. And so the other preacher said, well, I'll go next. He said, uh, I, I've got a weakness too. He said, as I'm preaching, he said, sometimes he said, I'll look out and he said, I'll kind of get focused on some beautiful woman in my congregation or something. Maybe some thoughts will go through my mind that shouldn't. And he said, I know that shouldn't happen. He said, I want y'all to pray for me and, and help me to get over that. But this time, a third preacher, he's just shaking. He's all to pieces. And so the preacher that brought this idea up said, look, brother, if this is going to make you nervous and you don't want to share, you fit, don't, don't, you don't have to share. He said, I just thought it might help us. He said, you just pray for us. And the third preacher said, oh, no, I, I don't mind sharing at all. He said, my weakness is gossip and I can't wait to get back to town. <laughs> you got to be careful who you confess things to. But that's not what he's talking about here. When he's talking about confessing your trespasses or confessing your faults one to another, he's talking about if you have aught with a brother. You need to go to that brother or that sister and make sure you straighten things out and pray one for another Amen. that you'll get everything uh, held out. You know, sometimes we hold a grudge. One man said holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. It doesn't help you to hold a grudge. To have unforgiveness in your life. But we should our, our response should always be pray. And he says pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's both physically and spiritually. Our greatest joy should come when we pray for others. When we lift up Amen. other people. Paul in Galatians chapter uh, uh, 6 verse 2 said, Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, if we're lifting up one another, if we're praying for one another as we should, it should bring joy into our lives and lift us up to know that we're doing something. You know, uh, uh, Americans are, are notorious for living for self. And, it, and some of our greatest joy comes when we help others, when we do for other people and we forget about ourselves. Amen. Paul wrote in the book of Colossians, He said, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to the glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Lord who has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light. Since we heard of your faith in Christ, is what he's talking about. He said, since, since we heard of this, he's talking about their faith in Christ and how they had come to know Jesus Christ. We should be praying for one another because we're all in this battle together. How many of us don't in, in some type of life have some kind of struggle with the enemy? Whether it's a physical illness that we're dealing with or whether it's a, a spiritual battle that we're going through. You know, and we don't know who, who the enemy is coming after. You know, today he may be attacking me, tomorrow it may be you. 
And we need to be lifting up one another. You know, every time we come together, whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night, any time we gather together, we always take time for prayer requests. And we need to try to remember. God God remembers every name that's mentioned. But we need to try to remember those needs and those requests and pray for one another. We need to remember, particularly our brothers and sisters, you know, we talk about when you join the church, we're, we're part of a family. And and in our Constitution, we say that we will support one another. We'll support physically with our presence, spiritually with our prayers, financially with our offerings. And and we need to be praying for one another every day. Look around, see who's in the crowd, see who's in the church. Know the people in the church and be lifting up one another every day. I thought about Job. You know, Job had a, a... a rough time in life for a short period of time. And he had some great friends. Friends you don't need. They came to Job and they said, Job, things like this don't happen to righteous people. Confess your sins and God will forgive you and He'll take all this away from you. Job said, I haven't sinned. I, I, I am one thing that I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to remain, retain my integrity even if I die in this condition. Even his wife came and said, give it up, Job, you're sin. But Job held on, never turned against God, never, you know, they finally just said, curse God and die. Job said, no, I'm going to re- retain my integrity. I'm going to live for God no matter what happens to me in this life. And the Bible said in Job 42.10, it said, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. When Job came to the place, he listened to his friends, he heard what they had to say, but he never turned against God. And finally, when Job didn't pray for himself, But when he prayed for his friends, God restored his health, his life, and gave him back twice as much as he had in the beginning. God doesn't tell us to only pray for our friends. He also tells us to pray for our enemies. Like Job, if we want things restored, particularly our joy, if you want to stop spending 30% of your income on finding joy, which you're not going to find because you can't find it. It's not out there. It's in here. Amen. And it comes from knowing God and fellowshipping with God, speaking to God. If you want your joy restored, spend time in prayer. Amen. Spend time in prayer for one another. Lift up the needs of other people. Have that fellowship with God and see if God will restore your joy. Man, let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for the privilege and honor to come and to share your word. And Father, as always, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of being here this morning. And Father, we pray this morning as you speak to hearts and lives, Father, we pray this morning that your word has come forth as you would have it to be brought and delivered. And we pray that that word has touched our hearts and that our lives will be forever changed. Father, we pray this morning that you minister to every need that's represented here this day. Most of all, Father, we pray this morning. If there would be one in our midst today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Father, we pray that this will be the day of their salvation. Help each one of us, Father, to hear your voice, to respond in a manner that would be pleasing unto you. And Father, as always, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I ask you to stand with me this morning as we close. As always, we ask you to be obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit.
this morning. You know, I, I believe with all my heart <clears throat> that we're living in the last days. We're living in a day and a time when Jesus could come at any moment for His church. And, you know, we it's been some time back now, uh, we went through the book of Revelation. And it's going to be a horrible time upon the earth for seven years. There's, the Bible says that the majority of the people living upon the earth are going to endure through that seven years. They will seek death, won't be able to find it. I hope that you're not one of those people. I ask you right now this morning just to look at your own heart and your own life. And if you're here this morning and you've never repented of your sins, you've, you've maybe been in church all your life, maybe you're a pretty good person and you don't really hurt anybody or do bad things, but you've never repented of your sins and invited Jesus to come into your heart. If you've never done that, I pray this morning that you will come as we sing this last verse, that you'll come and uh, you invite Jesus into your heart. We'll be glad to have prayer with you. I know there'll be others in the room. If you'd like somebody to come with you, I'm sure they would come. But you think about this this morning. If you were to die today, or if Jesus would split the eastern sky, and return for His church. He's not coming for people in church. He's coming back for His church. If you're not ready to meet Him, I pray that you'll come this morning and you'll meet Him as Lord and Savior of your life. Amen. As we sing this last verse.
I certainly hope this morning that you have felt Jesus in this place. Amen. Knowing that He's in your heart. Amen. Amen.